After reading the leaked ad training document, and knowing that subliminal messages began before the 1957 James Vickery flashing coke and popcorn debacle, I wanted to know the origins of subliminal messages and how they became acceptable to use on a supposedly free public. In the leaked ad training document, the advertisers say that they are re regulating America's production consumption cycle. Now we're going to find out how advertisers became social engineers and where exactly these engineers are taking us. Optical illusions were discussed by Aristotle and also Plato. They agreed that the mind could be tricked into misinterpreting the data our senses took in. Aristotle was the first to suggest that consciously unperceived stimuli could affect dreams. Forms of hidden writing have existed as far back as 400 BC. It's very possible sublimely embedded art was first employed to send covert military communications or secret government correspondence. This would work well because it would be deniable encryption, meaning it would allow the users to deny something was encrypted with a secret message at all. This is my hypothesis, not a fact. Art may have involved hidden meanings from the beginning of art itself. That's not to say art itself is evil or sinister, but that it can be used as a tool of evil by a person with evil intention. Some would even argue that since the unconscious influences the conscious, an artist could unconsciously include subliminal imagery in an artwork without ever consciously knowing it. I have had at least three artists contact me who have brought up this possibility. Many artists saying something takes them over, or that they allow the unconscious to take over in a way that could be seen as similar to automatic writing, which has been used both as a way for the living to talk to the dead in occult practice and by Freudian psychology as a form of therapy. Sometimes when a subliminal message is found in art, it's misinterpreted, as in the case of Da Vinci's Last Supper, where the feminized John was painted as a woman as an attack on the church by Da Vinci, who once had to have a judge dismiss a complaint that he had sex with the underage male. There was no secret code. Optical illusions were popularized in 1826 by Johannes Mueller, a psychologist who wrote two books on visual illusions. In 1857, an art movement came out of France called Symbolism. It lasted several decades. According to Wikipedia, the symbolist painters mind mythology and dream imagery for a visual language of the soul. That takes us straight to Sigmund Freud's publishing of the interpretation of dreams in 1899, often called his most influential book. Freud not only popularized the idea that man has an unconscious, but he also thought the unconscious made our decisions for us and that man did not truly have free will. Freud called part of this unconscious the ID. He saw the ID as the only true self. He said the ID is made up of animal desires and lacks personality and individuality. The ID operates on the pleasure principle. It does not care about reality or anyone else. The next part of the unconscious is the ego. Freud said the ego is there to satisfy the ID's desires, but to balance that with the reality of social standards and reality. The ego is also part of the conscious. Then there is the superego who is constructed out of the social and moral standards of that person's environment, also partially conscious and unconscious. One commonly depicted visualization of this is the boy with the devil and the angel on his shoulders. The devil is the ID, the angel is the superego, and the ego itself is the boy. But that's not completely accurate because Freud said that the ID slash devil is actually the true self. If the ID was not kept in balance by the ego, the ID would run wild and the person would devolve into an animal, living only to satisfy violent and sexual drives, without the influence of the moral conscious of the superego. The ego keeps the balance by defense mechanisms such as repression, denial, displacement, and sublimation. For this reason, along with a few others, Freud felt that man needed to be controlled. He thought the best way to do this was through the repression of emotion and drives. 
He thought the superego could be changed by changing the social and moral standards of society itself. To quickly explain some of the ego's defense mechanisms, known as perceptual defenses. The ego deals with the demands of reality, the ID, and the superego the best it can. When anxiety becomes overwhelming, the ego must defend itself. It does this by unconsciously blocking the impulses or distorting them into a less threatening form. Sublimation is the transforming of an unacceptable impulse, like sex, anger, or fear, into a socially acceptable or productive form. Someone with anxiety in this confusing world may become an organizer, business person, or scientist. Someone with powerful sexual desire may become an artist, photographer, or a novelist. According to Wikipedia, in psychology, sublimation is a term coined by Freud which was eventually used to describe the spirit as a reflection of the libido. In Freud's classic theory, erotic energy is allowed a limited amount of expression due to the constraints of human society. Freud considered this defense mechanism the most productive of the ones he identified. Sublimation is the process of transforming libido into socially useful achievements, mainly art. Repression. A psychological attempt by an individual to repel its own desires and impulses towards pleasurable instincts, such as desires, impulses, wishes, fantasies, or feelings, can be repressed in the mind as thoughts, images, and memories. Denial. Most people know what this means. Except for, I guess, those people who, in the wake of endless proof, still deny subliminal messages exist. Then, claim everything is this inexplicably massive coincidence. Displacement. The mind redirects feelings from an object felt to be dangerous or unacceptable to an object felt to be safe or acceptable. Say, for instance, from sex to a product. Freud's views have been called phaleocentric, with many of his theories having to do with penises. Freud was almost always seen with his cigar, a phallic symbol. He sarcastically stated, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Freud believed that the libido kept us in perpetual motion, and the goal of all this motion is to be still, to be satisfied, to be at peace, to have no more needs. The goal of life is death. He believed that every person has an unconscious wish to die. Death promises release from struggle, sometimes called the death wish or nirvana principle. This can be acted out on oneself, such as suicide or chronic alcoholism, or acted out on others in the form of violent aggression and destructiveness. Because of the wars in Europe, and Freud's understanding of the psyche, Freud felt man's libidinal forces could drive the masses into a fury of destruction. He said these libidinal forces needed to be repressed. He was like the Darwin of the mind, whose atheistic view of man and his mind reduced man to an animal, and reduced his mind to a collection of evolutionary relics and animal drives with no free will to make rational choices. It's this view of man that justifies governance by an intellectual elite. Man could not be left to think for himself. Man must be controlled. Our next stop takes us to the Woodrow Wilson administration. Could it be the administration that forced through Congress the Federal Income Tax and the Federal Reserve Act also played a role in bringing about the unconscious manipulation of the public? Woodrow Wilson formed the Committee on Public Information for the purpose of altering the public opinion to be in favor of the U.S. entering World War I. Public information should be translated to propaganda. Two of Wilson's advisors who took part in the committee were Walter Lippmann and Edward Bernays. Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He was responsible for getting Freud's books published in the U.S., and he popularized Freud's theories in America. Walter Lippmann was a founding member of the CFR and was known to be sympathetic to communism. Let us compare these two men. Bernays was the father of PR, Lippmann the father of modern journalism. Bernays wrote 
the books Crystallizing Public Opinion and Propaganda, Lippmann wrote the book Public Opinion. Bernays wrote a book called Engineering Consent. Lippmann used the term Manufacture of Consent. Bernays was an Austrian Jew, while Lippmann was a German Jew. Bernays said, as civilization becomes more complex, and as the need for an invisible government has been increasingly demonstrated, the technical means have been invented and developed by which public opinion may be regimented, with the printing press and newspaper, the telephone, telegraph, radio, and airplanes, ideas can spread rapidly, and even instantaneously, across the whole of America. Bernays said, The American motion picture is the greatest unconscious carrier of propaganda in the world today. It's a great distributor for ideas and opinions. The motion picture can standardize the ideas and habits of a nation. Bernays also said, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of the country. He also said, We are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they're to live together as a smoothly functioning society. And also, our invisible governors are in many cases unaware of the identity of their fellow members in the inner cabinet. In his book Public Opinion, Walter Lippmann said that the manufacture of consent is capable of great refinements no one I think denies. The process by which public opinions arise is certainly no less intricate than it has appeared in these pages, and the opportunities for manipulation open to anyone who understands the process are plain enough. As a result of psychological research, coupled with the modern means of communication, the practice of democracy has turned a corner. A revolution is taking place, infinitely more significant than any shifting of economic power. Under the impact of propaganda, not necessarily in the sinister meaning of the word alone, the old constants of our thinking have become variables. It's no longer possible, for example, to believe in the original dogma of democracy, that the knowledge needed for the management of human affairs comes up spontaneously from the human heart. In his book, Lippmann compared the masses to a great beast and a bewildered herd that needed to be guided by a governing class. He described the ruling elite as a specialized class whose interests reach beyond the locality. This class is composed of experts, specialists, and bureaucrats. According to Lippmann, the experts, who are often referred to as the elites, are to be a machinery of knowledge that circumvents the primary defect of democracy, the impossible ideal of the omnicompetent citizen. The trampling and roaring bewildered herd has its function to be the interested spectators of action. Not participants, participation is the duty of the responsible man, which is not the regular citizen, but an elite. Mass media and propaganda, therefore, are tools that must be used by the elites to rule the public without physical coercion. One important concept presented by Lippmann is the manufacture of consent, which is, in short, the opinion that the general public is not qualified to reason and decide on important issues. It is therefore important for the elites to decide for its own good and then sell those decisions to the masses. But what do these men have to do with subliminal messages? First, we must understand that what these men were attempting to do was written over 2,000 years before they lived. Their words and ideals match exactly those of Plato from 300 BC in his greatest work, The Republic. This republic does not resemble a modern republic. Instead, it's ruled by philosopher kings, who are the only people who can recognize what is truly good. 
In book six, he calls the masses a giant beast. He says to please this beast, you tell it what it likes is good and what it hates is evil. Plato envisioned a utopia that would be achieved when these philosophical elites took control. In Plato's utopia, private property is abolished and children are never allowed to know their parents. This is a collectivist system. Plato's Republic has been blamed for the rise in totalitarianism in the 20th century and also was a foundation for communism. Ayatollah Khomeini was thought to have based his role in the foundation of Iran's Islamic Republic on Plato's philosopher king. This collectivist system, ruled by an elite class, not only does not respect individual rights, it sees its citizens as beasts that need to be controlled and told what to think. On a side note to this is Masonic philosopher Manly P. Hall who said, The secret purpose of the Freemasons has all along been to bring about Plato's utopia that he called Atlantis, which would be led by a great philosopher king. In Manly P. Hall's book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, he says, when the mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper allocation of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. I just thought you might like to know why they see man the way they do. Wilson's Committee on Public Information was the primordial sea of subliminal manipulation. They recruited nationwide, bringing together top businessmen, politicians, journalists, academics, and of course, artists and advertisers. In 1917, in this committee, Freud's theories came together with political and business elites who felt they needed to control the public. Journalists, artists, and entertainers would be the foot soldiers in the war against independent thought. Now it was time to undo the American ideal of staying out of foreign entanglements. In a monumental propaganda campaign, the elites, by manipulating public opinion, now had the tools to take America wherever they wanted. According to Wikipedia, Bernays was one of the first to attempt to manipulate public opinion by using the subconscious. While most of the images of World War I propaganda I've seen are not high enough quality, for me to tell if they are subliminally embedded, the casual observer can see the underlying sexual theme. In this one, a topless maiden requires rescuing. I'm not sure what this image is implying, but I'm sure it's manipulative. Here we have a blonde and a nighty making a hand sign at sweaty males operating a large fail symbol. Both my wife and I initially thought she was removing her nightie strap. Also note her hand sign. I believe this image has several embedded sexes. Next we have an embedded image of a soldier who is looking into the eyes of the woman. Maybe that's why she's about to remove her clothes. What on the surface looks like someone saying a pledge actually has a double meaning. The meaning reinforced by the woman reaching her arm out with two fingers entering the wreath which is sexually symbolic. Another sex that was noticed when the image was inverted. Women in underwear must have been selling a lot of bonds. Part of this one's clothes is flapping in the wind. Another possible sex embed. Two sexes in the flag.
I noticed how oddly this one's hair was drawn right away. I mirrored the image to find a sex in her hair. So to get America into World War I, they decided to go with the hardcore sexual cell. In this 1917 Navy ad, they used the prove your penis is large tactic with this obvious yellow penis. They also embedded other strange images in World War II posters that I've shown in other videos such as a man in a top hat, a bull, and a telephone. They didn't stop with World War II. One of my favorite subliminals I've found is still on the ATF homepage. It's a sex, as well as a man. The man may be a federal agent type, or an image of Richard Nixon. It's up for debate. Propaganda after the war was converted to propaganda for profit. Bernays renamed this new form of propaganda public relations. Bernays invented the product placement ad. He felt man's desires must overshadow his needs. He advocated not selling to intellect, but instead selling to the desire to be happy. He saw cigarettes as a symbolic penis. Uncle Freud said, Women unconsciously felt inferior because they don't have penises. So Bernays had suffragettes encourage women to smoke, calling cigarettes torches of freedom. Bernays' peacetime plan was to channel man's libidinal forces into product consumption. The irrational masses that needed to be controlled could now fuel the greedy desires of the few, while also displacing or sublimating their violent and sexual desires onto the purchase of a product. Now a product is no longer just an object. Now it can be a status symbol, a statement of how virile you are, of how large your penis is. It doesn't matter how far you go in debt, as long as you have proven how virile you are and how very large your penis is. This can easily be observed by watching the midlife crisis male buying that sports or luxury car that puts them heavily in debt. We now buy products to confirm that we're good parents, to become free, to make ourselves more sexually attractive, to provide ourselves with a reward, to enhance the female body image as a solution to loneliness or nostalgia, to be a good wife, father, husband, and to become wise. The manipulators turn to business to fulfill the people's desires and business turned to the psychoanalysts to increase their profits. The result was a society that viewed their own self-worth by the purchases they made and the products they purchased. Meanwhile, more artists and better artists were being hired and contracted to create commercial advertisements. 
One of the earliest known commercial applications of subliminal messages was on a 1916 cover of the Saturday Evening Post by Norman Rockwell. Wilson Brian Key documented the subliminal sex on Rockwell's cover for the Saturday Evening Post, but according to Norman Rockwell, The Underside of Innocence, there are many instances of subliminal sexual embeds in other Norman Rockwell paintings as well. Some other subliminal embeds pointed out in the book Norman Rockwell, The Underside of Innocence are several phallus symbols, androgynous characters, and implied incest between Rockwell's family members. One example of this is from later on in Rockwell's career when he did propaganda posters for World War II, one of them being Rosie the Riveter. Rockwell's Rosie the Riveter is somewhat transgender as many of Rockwell's characters were. According to Norman Rockwell, The Underside of Innocence, the image is based on Freud's phallic mother, which I don't have time to get into. According to the author, Rosie's riveting gun is a phallus symbol. Salvador Dali fell under the influence of Freud using his unconscious symbolism in his surreal paintings. He was an anarchist and a communist in his life, and he's quoted as saying the following things. Now the subtle manipulation techniques of the artists and the musicians would be used by corporations to sell products to the masses. Now instead of listing the product qualities, they list the emotional needs the product will fill. Ernest Dichter pioneered what was called the depth approach to motivational research, where ad focus groups were mentally probed for hours by psychoanalysts just as a mental patient would be probed. Ernest Dichter in his book Motivating Human Behavior said, Much has been said about subliminal methods. Although they are not as dangerous as they have been made out to be, they are also not as ineffective as others pretend. However, we do not have to look for mysterious and magical formulas for flashing messages lasting a hundredth of a second on a television screen. What we can use instead, much more effectively, is background material or something that is even more subtle, the ad behind the ad. On May 18, 1956, the New York Times printed an article with Gerald Stahl, Executive Vice President of the Packaging Designers Council. He stated, Psychiatrists say that people have so much to choose from that they want help. They would like a package that hypnotizes them into picking it up. He urged food packers to put more hypnosis into their package designing. In 1934, Dichter started a psychoanalysis clinic on the same street in Vienna as the now elderly Sigmund Freud lived. In 1939, upon coming to New York, Dichter offered several companies his talents as a psychoanalyst to help them gain customers. His first consulting job was for Esquire, where he told them to focus on the nude pictures in the magazine. Next, he told Ivory Soap that bathing was an erotic purification ritual. After that, he told Chrysler that American men saw a car as a kind of mistress. According to Freud on Madison Avenue, Dichter told Chrysler to put in sexual double entendre into its advertising. It fits me like a glove and you just slip in it were two lines he suggested. During World War II, he became a program psychologist for CBS and did some anti-German propaganda. In Dichter's first book, The Psychology of Everyday Living, Dichter explained marketers had to address consumers' emotions, irrational behaviors, and unconscious drives, which were much more basic and powerful than logic. Ernest Dichter was made famous by the book, The Hidden Persuaders. Some of his motivation techniques were phrase completion, 
Association tests, oh. and the Roystag Inkblot test. It was Dichter that came up with the great idea to put candy in the grocery store checkout lanes. According to Freud on Madison Avenue, Dichter's perfect world was the human being being his or her own god. He said, I like to think of man as a higher ape, an animal who loves to grasp, whose palm is an erogenous zone. Dichter told Ronson Leiters that a flame was a symbol of sexuality. After reading that, I realized one of their logos was a figure ground illusion. One way it's a flame, the other way it's a vagina. Dichter invented the focus group. According to Freud on Madison Avenue, after the fallout from Vickery's flashing drink Coca-Cola and eat popcorn, Dichter, who was a firm believer in the science of subliminal perception, was worried that Vickery's stunt would give motivational research a bad name. The book also says, No ID prober was better known than Ernest Dichter, who is busier than ever sticking his nose into consumers' collective unconscious. Dichter had achieved almost mythical status with many in awe, if not afraid of the uber shrink. Dichter thought women bake cakes as an act of fertility. He recommended his clients emphasize a creative, fertile moment in their ads. He said women like bug sprays instead of more effective products because killing the roaches with a bug spray and watching them squirm and die allowed the women to express their hostility towards men. In 1960, he published The Strategy of Desire, where he said, Whatever your attitudes towards modern psychology or psychoanalysis, it has been proved beyond any doubt that many of our daily decisions are governed by motivations over which we have no control and of which we are quite unaware. He said, about the only label most Americans look at closely are those disclosing the proof of the liquor they buy. Dichter told his clients to think twice about featuring more blacks in advertising, saying blacks wanted to see white models. In 1971, he published Motivating Human Behavior, where he claimed that con continuous economic growth could solve all of the world's ills, poverty, nationalism, racism, War and even destruction of the environment were no match for the happiness to be found in consumerism. Vance Packard said in The Hidden Persuaders, the kind of tomorrow we may be tending toward in the merchandising of products may be exemplified by the use of depth probing on little girls to discover their vulnerabilities to advertising messages. No one, literally no one, evidently is to be spared from the all-seeing, big brotherish eye of the motivational analyst if a merchandising opportunity seems to beckon. In The Hidden Persuaders, one critic of Dichter's motivational research said, unless all advertising is to become simply a variation on the themes of the Oedipus complex, the death instinct, or toilet training, we must recognize that the motives which we deal with should be the manipulatable ones. This is yet another verification of the use of Freud's theories in advertising. In motivating human behavior, Dichter said, We were asked to help in motivating big companies to become interested in donating to Planned Parenthood. His advice to them is to present the problem in managerial terms. A product, in this case, children, are produced. He also told them to present Planned Parenthood as a more complicated and even more exciting project than a trip to the moon. How would you like to go to a different kind of moon? The moon of social, psychological, and political problems. Then he says, present overpopulation as a problem of negligence and stupidity. Most intelligent people react vigorously when they become aware of the possibility of continuing a mistake just on the basis of stupidity. In the final chapters of the book, Dichter tells us how to manipulate voters and how to unify Europe. One of the most interesting things about this book is the cover. It has a completely absurd subliminal message on the front. The figure on Dichter's book, when taken out of the background, is equipped with punk style hair, breasts, a miniskirt, a bracelet, and even boots. 
The fact that the lines are pink reinforced my interpretation. So the scientific or pseudo-scientific foundation of subliminal messages would be based on several of Freud's theories, such as how the subconscious works, libidinal forces, drives, dream symbolism, penis infatuation, the Oedipus complex, defense mechanisms such as denial, repression, displacement, and sublimation. The philosophical basis for subliminal messages may have began with Plato's bewildered herd, but was modernized by two agents of propaganda who would entangle America in its first world war, Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann. This new powerful propaganda would harness man's animal drives into productive causes such as going to war and immeasurable profits. The final component of this all-powerful weapon was the actual communication. The artist had been contemplating uses of dream symbolism and the language of the unconscious mind since the 1800s and also the copy or slogan writers who will tell you anything for a buck. So the primordial sea and the evolution of subliminal messages would seem to be the Wilson administration's Committee on Public Information. The same administration that snuck by the income tax and the Federal Reserve System. The same administration that attempted to form the framework of a world government with the League of Nations. Now after nearly 100 years of refining, is the public now a harnessed beast? to be led where the elite social engineers see fit, even if that's to war, poverty, famine, or death?